Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews. Kind of a corny joke, but a woman told her husband, get up, make the coffee. He said, why? And he said, because the Bible says Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. When you find Hebrews 2, I want you to mark it with your finger and go to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. Hebrews 2, Psalm 8. And the pages are getting quieter. That's good. It means you found it. If you haven't found it by now, you're not going to. Are you comfortable? Let me preface this message real quick to tell you that when it's your birthday, do you like to see everybody else in your family and friends getting attention? When you finally get that day, when February the 8th, excuse my birthday, comes around, and on that day, everybody's paying attention to one another except the birthday boy. I was so excited for birthdays. You know, we, got, we didn't get toys, we got a toy. And I remember on a birthday, I was probably eight or nine years old, my mother won a cake from Culpepper's Bakery in Florence, Alabama. Remember that age? Culpepper's. Won it on the phone, which, you know, you, you had to be the certain dollar to get it. And she would always keep that finger on the dial to, to catch it. Got my birthday. Got my name called on the radio. It was a famous moment for me. Uh... My uncle, Jerry, drove across Florence and, and picked up the cake, drove through ice and snow in his 69 Charger and brought it back up on the mountain and brought me my cake. What a special day. I got a Tonka toy. If you remember Tonkas, they would, you could cock that thing back and put that little toy in there and shoot it across the room. Snow was coming up through the cracks in the living room, which was our old porch that my dad had walled in to make into a living room, and snow was coming up through it. And we had that green indoor-outdoor carpet that dad could afford to put in there. I remember playing. What if on that day he had brought that cake and brought it in and gave it to my little brother and then they got that toy and gave it to my sister and it's my birthday. On the 25th of December, we're going to celebrate the birth of Christ. Don't make it about you. Amen. Amen. It's so, it's so, oh man, it's so hard we want to make it about the children and blessing one another. We're going to give a gift for a gift. You know, if you get a gift, you got to give a gift. Is that right? I mean, that's Bible, right? Quid pro quo. If I get a gift, you get a gift. You know, we're going to have to make sure that we do that all the way around and take care of one another. But if we're not careful, we're going to forget the sacredness of December the 25th that we have set apart for all these years to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus. Can I get a praise in this house? Amen. Just a little bit. If you think about it, all the elements of Christian worldview are in the Christmas story because the coming of Christ changed history. Literally from B.C. to A.D., we aren't straining things to say everything is different now that Christ has come to the world. This isn't a sentimental thought, like, you know, the little drummer boy, or, or I'll, I'll, come, I'll be home for Christmas. The coming of Christ establishes the truth of all that we believe in, and we've seen in its proper context, Jesus' birth speaks with incredible relevance to 21st century people who, right off Christmas, is nothing more than eggnog and candy canes. When you read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, why would God visit us? Why would God even come down here? Uh, and the Scripture tells us He's Emmanuel, God with us, so He's God in Himself wrapped in flesh, but one in a certain Paul talking here, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visit him? Now, one, one reason, have you found me, sis? There it is. But when a certain place testified, in other words, this is what Paul said somewhere in the Bible it says, Have you ever said that? Don't get a, don't be busting my chops when I say stuff like that. People say, well, you are, you're a preacher. You ought to know where it's at. There are times I forget where it's at, but I know it's in there. You know, so, so when I read Paul saying, what, this one thing is certain, is testified saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visited him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet, speaking of man. 
For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet things put under him. In other words, it's not working out the way we thought. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, I'll break that down and help you understand it as, as I'm trying to understand it more and more. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this season. I thank you for your goodness. It's a great church, great house. God, I feel your presence. I feel healing in the place. I know, God, that your, your spirit is upon us. You're going to speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Okay, so Paul said, in a certain place, it was testified or it was said, I found a certain place. It's in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. And the question has to be, why us? When I consider thy heavens, the work of your fingers. This is David talking. You know, David was a, was a gazer of stars. He, he hung outside. He camped out a lot. The moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you visited him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and ca it has crowned him with glory. See, it's exa Paul's actually quoting this out of Psalm 8. With glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. And you put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen. Yeah, and even the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. And whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So God made us for greatness. And we made a total mess of it. I mean, we have screwed some things up. We blew our shot at immortality. I believe when Adam and Eve in the beginning, God had a plan for them to live forever. And then he had to establish something else after the, the sin in the garden. And now the graveyards are filling up. But God is not finished with us yet. Psalm 8 verse 4, what is man you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him. As if to say, why bother with people like us? We ruined Eden. You gave us another chance, and we fouled that up badly, and then you sent a flood to wipe out the human race except for one family. Why not just hit the delete button? Why not just hit delete on the human race? Why not just admit that this was an experiment that didn't work out? No one could blame God if he decided to get rid of all of us, could we? Couldn't blame him at all. David's question comes to the very heart of Christmas. What is man that you should pay attention to us? What is man that God should care about us? I know one of the things I'm always trying to get you to do and I to do is to pay attention to God. Yeah. When's the last time you paid attention to God? When's the last time that you thought about him over a meal or over a blessing or over a healing? Okay, that's good. But how about the flip side? What is man that God would think about us? Amen. To look down here and look at your life all messed up, screwed up because you try to run things. I'm talking about people on the internet, not y'all. Y'all good. Amen. <laughs> but that, that, that God would look down here and be mindful of us. Amen. And care about us. Amen. We felt so miserably. Why should God care at all? The King James Version renders verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you would even visit him? Why would God care enough to visit people like us? You know, when I visit people, it's usually for a purpose. It's a reason. Amen. Uh, sickness or something's gone on in their life. or I, I need to. I just fellowship, hang out with them. Why would God want to fellowship with us? Why would God want to hang out? This hits me how much he loves us. How much he cares. There are people in your life you care for that don't reciprocate back. There are people that you'll send gifts to that won't send nothing back. There are people that you'll call that they don't call back. You just love them like that. You're probably a parent. <laughs> Amen. And so is he. So is he. So it is right at this point that we see the glory and the wonder and the mystery of the gospel. When the writer of Hebrews was trying to impress on the readers the greatness of our salvation, he actually quoted the verse out of chapter 8. He applies it. And there's a lot here that you've got to look at. First off, Jesus had to become like us in his nature. And that's the incarnation. That's what Bethlehem's about. That's about him putting on flesh and wrapping it around himself. That's Christmas, my friend. He came into the world as a tiny baby born in a stable in an obscure little village, born into poverty, unwanted by the world he was just an, another face in the crowd no one seemed to care that he had arrived and you got to understand Jesus had to do this in order to truly visit us he had to become like us 
John 1 tells us, and many of you know the beginning of John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God. Amen. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. If you look at it in the New Living Translation, it says, So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father, the one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds. This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he has existed long before me. Now hold on, John. John got revelation. He got understanding. This is a man, a cousin, talking about his younger cousin. And he says to his younger cousin, He'd been around a lot longer than I have. And some people never catch this, man, that Jesus is eternal word. In the beginning was the word. word, and the word was God, and the word is God. Amen. He's always been. He didn't just show up when he got here. God said, well, i got to send the son. Let me put him up and send him down. He was always with the Father. It's hard to separate him. You know when I baptize People, uh, especially if you were brought up in church and you hear me baptize, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and as the disciples carried forth the commandment, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you know there are churches that split over that? There are churches that, unless you're you a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost church, then, then that's the only church there is. Unless you're a Jesus-only church, that's the only church there is. And I started looking at that, and I said, God, I preached in all these churches. Why are they arguing over the formula? Why are they arguing over what's being said? Yeah. The issue is the old is gone, the new has come. Yeah. That's what really matters. It's the spirit of the thing. It ain't just the word. So I just use them all. I, either I'm all wrong or I'm all right. <laughs> Amen? So in Jesus, in the beginning, again, it's a holy mix-up. It's a glorious mix-up. I don't understand it all, but I know that's the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and these three are one. Just like you are body, soul, and spirit, and you are one, but yet there's these separate parts of you. There's the emotional part of you. you know, sometimes as a man, I'll start crying, and I can feel my flesh going, why are you crying? Well, sh suck it up, big boy. It's like this fight going on inside of me. And everything just don't agree. Last week I got, I ate something that made me... I didn't just cry. Man, I blew snot out my nose, and I, th I was throwing projectiles from here to the front row. And, and, and my spirit was going, come on, boy, come on, you can make it. And my flesh was going, just give up and die. You know, I just, I mean, know what I'm talking about. Amen. And so I see this Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and, and John said, when I saw him, I realized he's older than I am. He existed long before I got here. Amen. This is the one I was talking about. From the abundance we have all received one gracious blessing from another. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son is himself God and is near to the Father's heart. Amen. He has revealed, he has revealed God to us. In other words, when I saw Jesus, I saw the Father. So in John's gospel, those last five verses are so important. He, he, they're like the mighty finale of a musical composition played by some great symphony orchestra. We hear the rolling of the drums, the crashing of the cymbals, the entire percussion section of the orchestra alive. The fingers of, of the harpist fly across the strings and the trumpets blast. Amen. I'm telling you, he came into the world. It, here's the thing about it. He came into the world. I've mentioned this so many times. I know some of you are getting tired of it. But I came from a little place on the side of Wheeler Mountain. And we had an outhouse, a two-holer. And we had a, a well house. And we drew water up and we brought it in the house. Uh, uh, some of my family that had never seen my old bedroom saw it. You'd have to duck. I have to duck to get into it. It's a lean-to off the side of the house. It became the bathroom. It was my brother and I's shared room. We shared rooms for 18 years together. That there's something about that. We had a, one heater in the kitchen. And it, so whenever it was uh, cold, you got up real fast. You ran in there, the heater. And I talked to you about rotisserie granny. as she would roll around the stoves and the heaters and things of that nature. And warm up every, all the way around. I told you there's no insulation in the house. We discovered that as we began to remodel it. Dad never put any insulation in. I figured he, we just figured we'd be tough. I can't imagine grabbing my children and my wife and saying, Let's go back to that. Let's go back to the outhouse and Sears and Roebuck. Y'all don't even know what that this is all about. 
In this internet age, you can't even get enough newspaper to wipe. I'm telling you, it's just terrible. Uh, let's, go, let's go back to drawing the water up, breaking the ice. Let's go back to, to a time when very little electricity in the house. You know what that's called? That's called descending. Condescending. Condescension. Here's Jesus. I don't know yet what heaven's all about. But I see it as a place of purity. If, if there's air in heaven, fresh air, food, you can, can't imagine without the weight gain. A, a place of tremendous mobility where nothing obstructs you. Tremendous fellowship that Jesus was in heaven and Moses was taken from the earth and he met him in heaven and fellowship with him. When David, the psalmist, makes it to heaven and he fellowship with David. When Ruth makes it to heaven and he fellowship with her. When Rahab made it to heaven, he fellowship with her. When Noah made it to heaven, how was that boat building, son? And Jesus fellowship with him. And then one day the father looked at Jesus and he said, I need you to go down on earth. They have screwed everything up. You've seen what a mess Moses told you, Noah told you, Ruth told you, David told you. They told you all the prophets have told you they killed Isaiah I had to put him back together before I put him up here amen do you see the mess there in would you go down there my son and show them who I really am and then Jesus condescended ascension is rising from obscurity to greatness my life has been one of poverty all the way up to where I'm at now. I, I've ascended in life. I've had a couple of hiccups, but basically ascended. Many of you in here, you've come up in life. You start, you got the same stories I got. You started down here and you started ascending. Life is about ascending. But here is the Christ condescending. You know what Christmas is all about? It's about him stepping out of the balconies of heaven. And coming down here to this lowly place of rejection and meanness and wickedness. And he, the, people, the Bible says he came to his own. His own received him not. They didn't love him. So he showed up down here. He condescended and wrapped himself. Oh, what love the Father has for me and you. Amen. That he would condescend and come down here. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about Jesus coming here to earth teaching us how to love one another again. Oh, y'all ain't loud enough. I hope I, I hope I do better in the next church. The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. To condescend means to, to lower oneself to a level not normally occupied, physically, mentally, or socially. It means to descend voluntarily to the level of another person. Amen. And with human beings, this is not always done with kindness. We condescend. We, we put people down. We put them in their place all the time, talking to them like that. Sometimes there's an air of contempt and snobbery and haughtiness in human condescension, but not with Jesus. It also means to be graciously willing to do something regarded as beneath one's dignity. I don't want to have to clean this toilet, but I'll clean it. I don't want to have to serve it, but I'll do it. Amen. And by doing that, I leave an example for others to follow. That's what Christ did. This is what God did when he became flesh. With a mysterious mixture of divine grace and love, he performed the greatest act of condescension of all time and eternity. The word that John personified is the very expression of and manifestation of God. The creative power of God was in the Word. With such limitless power, the Word of God condescended to be compressed into human flesh. John purposely used the word flesh. Amen. When you read that, when you study it, Greeks hated the word flesh. They, didn't need, they wanted to think that Jesus was more spirit than flesh. They, flesh, flesh is nasty. Flesh is, is, is ugly. Flesh is mean. They recoiled from the word of flesh. They wanted to hear about deity. This flesh is corruptible. It's temporary. It's doomed to be destroyed. And yet Jesus was 100% flesh. Amen. No God would deal with anything as disregarding and degrading as human flesh. Yet that's exactly what God did. He entered human flesh, which stands for the whole person. In becoming flesh, God accepted the limitations of humanity. The scripture says Jesus slept. Jesus wept. He was hungry. In other words, he had flesh. 
just like me and you. He accepted his humanity. He became vulnerable to those natural human weaknesses that accompany our flesh, the hunger, the thirst, the weariness, amen, the pain that he experienced at the cross. He experienced the emotional traumas that we experienced, disappointment, sorrow, hurt, loneliness, rejection. Why me, Jesus? Why? Yeah, and Jesus said, look, I've been there. Now, you, you got rejected by a man. You got rejected by a woman. You got rejected by children. I had a whole world reject me. I'd done no wrong. I condescended here to teach and show them who the Father was. While Jesus committed no sin while he was on earth, he experienced sin in a way that was far more overwhelming than committing it. Why did he cry in Gethsemane? What caused him to sweat great drops of blood? When he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you, but take this cup away from me. Jesus was not about to succumb to temptation to sin. It was worse than that. He was about to drink the cup containing your sin, my sin, mankind's sin. John said that Jesus lived for a while amongst us. Literally, that means he pitched his tent or cast his lot with us. He moved in with us. Amen. When Jesus came into your life, he moved in with you. Amen, hanging out with you. Another thing here, Jesus tasted death because that is our common destiny. All of us were to taste it. Life is short. It's appointed unto man once to die. Jesus could not have truly visited us if he had held himself back from the last enemy that confronts us, and that's death. In order to be fully human, he had to taste death, and he went through it. He suffered and he died because that was the only way he could save us. Only by dying could he give us life. Jesus came to restore all that we had lost in Eden. Well, we lost a lot. Oh, I, and I know you weren't there. And I know you think to yourself, well, if I was Adam, I'd have never ate that peach. I'd have never, if I was, if I, if I was uh, Eve, I'd have never gave that, that peach. It had to be a peach. It could have been an apple. Apples are just apples. But you get a peach. Whew. That's tempting. Mm, thank you. The last Adam, he came to reverse the curse that we brought upon ourselves. Now, in heaven, he's crowned with glory and honor. And one day, all those who believe in Christ will share that glory too. Hebrews 2, 8. At present, we do not see everything subject to him. Better days are coming, but they aren't here yet. Today, we still weep for little children who pass too soon. We wonder about all the suffering and pain and heartache and sickness and death we are surrounded by. And, and here's the thing. I, I believe in divine healing. I believe there are times you pray for and, and God resurrects people. But our glory has faded. We're not what we're supposed to be. Amen. God had set us up, literally. He, he had us set up where we weren't going to age. That's why I always use the term when we get to heaven, we'll be 33. 33 is about as max as you're going to get. James uh, we, we sung happy birthday to you. You're 35. You're, it's over. <laughs> it don't get no better now. Hey, it's downhill. Wait till Fitty get here. Fitty. Oh, man, then I heard about City. Woo! It, it, it is precisely this point that Christians and Christmas speaks as clearly to us. We were made for glory. But our glory faded a long time ago. First, we disobeyed. We died on the inside, then we started dying on the outside, then we turned to our own devices. God, we don't need you at all. Leave us alone. We wonder why he would even look our way. We, we, you know, we've met the enemy. I'm telling you who he is. The enemy's us. And God said, I will not leave you alone. I, this thing I love about God, he's jealous and he's nosy. He's all up in your stuff. He will never stop being. He loves you like that. Amen. And I've had my kids say, quit looking at my phone. Huh? Don't tell me your kids ain't done that. They're here at a certain age. They don't want you looking at their phone. Oh, don't look. Don't look at my, don't look at my computer. Don't look. And here's God. He said, what'd you say? <laughs> That's my phone. That's my computer. I look at it if I want to. I will not leave you alone. I will not let you destroy all yourself, each other, and the world I have made. I love you too much to let you alone. So he sent prophets. We killed them. He wrote letters. We ignored him. He told us how to live, and we said, who are you to tell us what to do? Who do you think you are? God? Who do you think you are? Keep rolling. We mocked the God who made us. We broke his laws. We said we don't need him. And we made up our own gods that we like much better because they look so much like us. Mm. Look what we did. We made a mess of things. 
God had every reason to kill us all, but he didn't. He said, I love you too much to let you go. And after we trashed him and trashed everything, he said, let me come down there. I'll show you once and all and for all how much I love you. We didn't pay any attention. It didn't even make sense to us. How would God visit us? This is Christmas, my friend. But he did. And he came to the world in a very strange way. He entered a virgin's womb. And he came out as a baby born in Bethlehem. A baby named Jesus. Born to save us from our sins. And so, we, so he came as a baby. He grew up. What did we do? Killed him. Murdered him. Hung him on a cross. That's the thanks we gave God for visiting us. Because you prepare for this Christmas. Look at the end of the story. It's not about us. It's about him. C.S. Lewis said, The Son of God became a man to enable men to become the sons of God. I close with these words. I cannot prove to you everything I said is true. I preach by faith. I believe this is 5,000 years of known history. I know there have been millions of years of the earth. I don't dispute that. I don't dispute the theories and, and all the subjection of all that stuff. Don't even argue with it. But there's 5,000 years of known history of men struggling, walking through life, trying to make it on their own. And when Christ came over 2,000 years ago, he changed the world forever. It'll never be the same. It was the great condescension. Christmas matters because truth matters. And the heart of the truth is that God did not leave us alone. But in our misery, in our mess, he came to visit us. One dark night in Bethlehem, amen, Christmas is all about who we are and who God is. Amen. And how far God is willing to go for us. So at Christmas, we learn how much he loves us. And there's nothing more important than that. Amen. Psalm 8 again, out of the Message Bible. God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle courses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky, jewelry, moon, stars, mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being God's. Bright with Eden's dawn light, you put us in charge of your handcrafted world. Repeated to us your Genesis charge. Do you remember what the Genesis charge was? Take dominion over the earth. Take dominion over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the fowl. Take dominion over it. You made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild. Birds flying and fish swimming. Whales singing in the ocean deeps. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world. Let me repeat that. Even wild, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deep. It was just a few years ago, oceanographers said, did you know that whales make noise? And they were so excited that they actually could hear with them sonars the whales singing thousands of years ago God said and the whales singing it's like every time science discovers something God goes duh (laughs) stand with me if you're able Majestic is his name. As you get closer to Christmas, it'll it'll fade away. We'll be in January. But don't don't forget this great condescension. And when somebody talks to you, Christmas, my friend, is about God himself wrapping himself in flesh. If I never get to preach another Christmas message, this is it. He came down for us. And I know people today... They're too, too busy, 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 busy about paying any attention to him. But I thank God, no matter how busy we get, God looks down at us and says, you're mine, I love you, 
and you got my attention. I want to visit with you, hang out with you. I'll take whatever. T- and it, it does bother me. We ought to give him more time. But we're going to kick ourselves. I promise you, when you, by the time you get to heaven, you're going to have a new body, and you're going to be able to move like you've never moved before, and you're going to take your right foot, and you're going to kick your left buttocks on your way into heaven for all the things you wished you'd have done while you were here. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Jesus, you've been sweet to us this morning. Felt your presence. You're visiting with us. You live among us and in us. Oh, how sweet the Christmas story is. You came from heaven to earth to show us the way. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. What a great God you are. If you're without God this morning, don't you think it's time to turn that around? Don't you think it's time to accept the Christ into your life? Give him control. Ask him for direction. He'll take away the loneliness. You get direction, loneliness will leave. The needs in your body, the doctors can't do anything for you. There is a great physician. The scripture, he's known as Jehovah Rophe, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Rophe, my healer, Jehovah Shama, my peace. There's so many things about him. Amen. Jehovah Titsit Canoe. My righteousness, that's a lot of things he can be for you. So if you've been without God, would you slip your hand up and let me pray with you this morning? We'll just pray a quick prayer together. We'll ask Christ to come into your life. How about you just hand up and back down real quick. Everybody good? Every head up, every eye open. Look around the room. Realize everybody in here said they're going to be with you in heaven. That's worth serving God for, huh? Maybe you just ain't ready yet. All right. We'll be around. Be condescending. I've heard preachers be condescending. I've seen doctors get condescending. Lawyers get condescending. Judges be condescending with their power and their gavel. Football coaches get condescending. Basketball. Athletes. Condescending. Millionaires. Condescending. Billionaires being condescending to millionaires. But the God of all the earth created the heavens and the earth. When he got condescending, he said, I just want to come eyeball to eyeball with you. I want to walk you through this life. Come on, let's give God one more praise. Be seated for a brief moment. Our servant leaders are coming up. It is a, I call it a mandatory choice. Everybody understand mandatory choice? You don't have to be a giver. You don't have to be a tither. But in the Bible, it was mandatory. But here in the New Testament, we just have a choice with it. But I'm going to tell you in the book of uh, Joshua, some men went in and they took the tithe out of a city and it cost the death of 30 something men because they took the tithe of Jericho that belonged to God there's a curse attached to keeping things that don't belong to you learn how to let go of and watch God bless you again my life has been one of ascending but it didn't happen that way till I learned principles and this is one of the great principles in my life is the principle of tithing and giving. Amen. Even special offerings. And I'll say it again. If God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Amen. The problem is it gets stuck in you. You're spiritually constipated. You need a Holy Ghost enema. Amen. So the things will start flowing back out of your life again. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. You're not going to hear that in another church. If you, if you need to offer an envelope, lift your hand. Amen. Our servant leaders will make their way to you as David comes. We've got quite a few announcements to make. All right. December 22nd, Taden's Food Pantry. Sign up in the back of church now to receive Christmas blessings, boxes of food. Um, 
If you guys need some food for the holidays, they have them, but they don't know if you don't tell them. So you got to tell them. Just let them know we, we have it. We want to give it away, but we can't give it to people that don't say anything. Uh, December 15th, Lifehouse Ministries donation item to help moms and kids at Christmas. Uh, list of items were handed out two weeks ago. Please bring items by. Next Sunday is the deadline. Is there anything you want to say about that? Is there any any more flyers in the back? If, if on the counter. Okay. And if you're still, if you, maybe you didn't get one of those flyers, uh, there's a flyer in the back, and it'll let you know what they can they can uh, receive. Um, also, December fifteenth, the Crosby Campus Kids Dinner and a Show. Okay, Miss Rhea came to me, so I want a show then a dinner. So she wanted everybody to know. You got to sign up if you want dinner. Today is the last day for signups. So y'all tell her I said that because she came up to me before serving. She's like, David, you have to tell the people. So I'm telling you, today is the last day for signups for the dinner. Anybody can come to the show. But if you want dinner, they need to know how many people to make dinner for. Uh, December 15th and the 22nd. It's a special gift wrapping for you. Crosby Campus Lift and Swap Ministries will wrap your gift if you need one. All donations and proceeds will, again, go to the ARC Missions Fund. Uh, December 12th, Spark Sisterhood Christmas Party. Thursday, December 12th, here in Crosby, in the, in the back, bring a wrapped gift that's $10 for the exchange. Yep. Ladies, I encourage y'all to come to this. We're going to provide the food. We're going to be connecting. That's what Pastor's been preaching on lately is connections. And really would like for y'all to sign up in the back to be able to come to that. If it's a $10 gift that's keeping you from coming, don't worry about that. You don't have to participate in that, that, that gift drawing or anything. But we want you to come and just be able to share with each one of us and be with us and have a good time. Um, this is the best time to do that. So just step out of the box and sign up in the back so we know how much food to order, and please come. As the offering goes through, uh, Ken, if you get some of swap, if uh, you need prayer for your body, you need prayer for your finances, relationships, but in any area uh, that you need prayer for, we're going to have some uh, prayer warriors up front here. And if you need prayer, just you know, just boldly come on up. The scripture says if any two or three of us agree that God will do it for us. I found that to be an absolute uh, amazing principle. When I need something, I'm going to agree with people. Amen. If God gets you agreeing on stuff, he'll show up. So well, during the, when the offering goes by, if you would like to come up for prayer, please come on up. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Oh, and there's going to be swap right after service in the back. See Miss Linda and Mr. Rich.